James has been the CEO of Etihad since 2006 and brought with him to the Abu Dhabi-based airline more than 30 years of travel industry experience. His career began at Ansett Airlines and he continued on to senior positions with BMI British Midland, Hertz, Forte Hotels, and Gulf Air. Since 2006, he's overseen the rapid growth of the UAE's national airline, adding 35 new destinations and 46 new aircraft, and increased the number of passengers carried by 4.5 million. Under his watch, Eddie had become, has become the fastest growing airline in the history of aviation. In 2008, CEO Magazine named him Aviation CEO of the Year and named him Visionary of the Year in 2010. The number of awards and distinctions Eddie had has earned during Mr. Hogan's tenure as CEO is staggering and the list continues to grow. James is a Royal Fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, a member of IATA's Board of Governors, served as Chairman of the Travel and Tourism Governors of the World Economic Forum in Davos, and near and dear to our hearts here at the Wings Club, generously supports the humanitarian air transportation efforts of ISTAT's Airlink and serves on its advisory committee. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear that Etihad, under its current leadership, reflects the best of Arabian hospitality. Cultured, considerate, warm, and generous, please help me extend that same spirit of hospitality to welcome James Hogan to our podium. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Dave, for that kind introduction. It's always good to tell you a little bit about the product because I'm, no, I'm not supposed to do a hard sell today, but I thought I'd give you a bit of a flavor. It's also good to see such a great seat factor. I hope, Dave, the yield gives you the rask that you're looking for today. Good man. With me today is um, a number of my team. Gerd Boven is the uh, Senior Vice President of the Americas, just sitting over here. And Gerd is our man here, based in New York, who's been looking over our development in the Americas. And like the millions of other people who visit this great city every year, I love to be in New York. It's a bit crazy at the moment with the traffic, uh, but it is truly one of the world's great cities. Last time I spoke here in January 2009, Barack Obama was on the brink of becoming the world's most powerful man. Quite frankly, it seems like yesterday. Three years later, he was already preparing for the next election, and what a time it's been. At Etihad, we have certainly been very busy. As Dave mentioned, we have added 15 destinations, including Melbourne, Chicago, Nagoya, Tokyo, and Seoul. We've added 21 aircraft to our fleet, including four dedicated freighters. We've added more than 1,000 employees, and we have a company with 120 different nationalities. We have moved into a new terminal, opened a new headquarters, and seen our passenger numbers grow from 6 million to just over 7 million in 2010. We have risen from 10th to 6th in the Skytrax global rankings, and we have been named the world's leading airline, not once, but twice. So it's certainly been a, a busy, but a productive time. But I'm not here today to talk about the past. I'm here to talk about the future. I am, as Dave mentioned, the CEO of the national airline of a country with a tenth of all known oil reserves. And here I am coming to talk to you about environmental concerns. It may sound a little counterintuitive. The United Arab Emirates is currently one of the world's leading producers of carbon emissions per capita. Received wisdom then would tell you I am the last person to talk to you about advances in game-changing green technologies or sustainable practices. The problem with received wisdom, however, as you all know, is it is lazy and nearly always wrong. The United Arab Emirates and Abu Dhabi in particular have spent the last five years working to position itself at the forefront of a green technology revolution not just as a user of that technology, but as a base in which revolutionary green technologies can be developed. Investment in pursuing this aim has run to billions of dollars in less than a decade. And Etihad, as a national airline, is working in sync with this vision. Of course, Abu Dhabi and the UAE have advantages when it comes to adopting environmental best practices. The United Arab Emirates is a young country. In December, it will be only 40 years old, and it is using its considerable wealth to build homes, schools, and offices. In fact, all of the infrastructure required to be a leading global economic powerhouse. It is ideally positioned 
to ensure that green best practice occurs with the lack of the first brick, not looking backwards. Bad habits are always culturally ingrained. Likewise, Etihad is a mere eight years old. From the start, with a clean sheet of paper, we've had the opportunity to do things the right way. We've been able to challenge convention. We've been able to adopt innovations quickly and to change the way we operate where we can see immediate benefits. So it's from a unique and some may say a privileged position I stand here today, one that I believe no other CEO of a national airline shares. So what I'd like to address today is three points. And they are, the environment cannot be an afterthought to business. I say that not as a, as a tree hugger, but as a pragmatist who recognises that good environment self-governance is a lot cheaper than being told what to do after the event. New technology is key. It is one thing changing attitudes, but on its own it's not enough. 21st century technology and innovation offer previously unavailable opportunities to change. And no one saves a word on their own. Partnerships, like everything else in business, are the key to going green. An integrated collaborative approach is essential. But first, I'd like to talk to you, if I may, on Abu Dhabi and outline some of the measures being taken to change the perception of the UAE from the highest emitter of CO2 per capita to the world's leading incubator of green technology. Abu Dhabi is one of the seven emirates that make up the United Arab Emirates, a country, a population of nearly five million people. It is blessed with abundant energy reserves and inducing the considerable wealth generated by those reserves to build the brightest possible future for its people. That is a future that will embrace fully the ideals of living in harmony with the natural environment. It was envisioned by its founder, Sheikh Syed, when he unified the country almost 40 years ago. Despite the demands of building his new nation, he never lost sight of the need to consider the environment and how that impacts his society. He led initiatives on water conservation. He planted trees to limit desertification. He created large-scale nature reserves and programs to protect individual species. All of this, quite frankly, well ahead of his time. More importantly, he put in place visionary government and regulatory structures that were far ahead of other countries in the region, and some may say across the world, as well as investing significantly in education and research. Today, much of, of this thinking is embedded in a blueprint which we're part of, which is called the 2030 Plan. It's a roadmap, a document that enshrines the importance of the environment as a core strategic issue. The innovation and levels of investment in projects that will secure a sustainable future for Abu Dhabi are indicated and very key to the priorities that they've set in their state agenda alongside security and economic growth. For example, the ESTIMA rating systems. ESTIMA is Arabic for sustainable. Demands by law that all construction projects in Abu Dhabi meet minimum environmental standards for new buildings. Everyone is expected to play a part in meeting the objectives of the 2030 plan. Government departments, state and private companies, and society as a whole. As I mentioned earlier, Abu Dhabi is actively investing in making itself the world leading knowledge centre for green technologies, costing more than $20 billion, the Mazda initiative. Mazda, being Arabic for source, is a perfect example of this. The Mazda city is one of the world's most sustainable cities. The Mazda Institute, located within the city, will be home to the very best and brightest minds in the field of sustainable technology from all over the world. Solar energy, wind energy, carbon capture and storage, Mazda will aim to play a part in the major breakthroughs in its exciting areas over the coming years. And they have the potential to be involved in these major changes. So it might seem extraordinary for one of the world's preeminent carbon economies to be investing so heavily in clean technologies. But that's the beauty of it. For once, clear-eyed idealism of Sheikh Syed measures perfectly with commercial pragmatism. 
The rulers of Abu Dhabi know that oil will not always be the world's leading source of energy. And so they're going to be making sure now that when change comes to solar or to wind or to whatever it proves to be, that they are ideally positioned to continue to be one of the world's centres of energy. In fact, given the focus with which Abu Dhabi is going about achieving this aim and the investment it has made, in 2009, the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA, chose its base, its headquarters, in Mazdar City, rather than in Europe or even here in America. So that's Abu Dhabi, a place that is every day challenging received wisdom and showing the world how much modern Arabia has to offer. Now let me tell you a little bit more about Etihad and how we are ensuring that our airline is doing everything it can to fly in an environmentally sustainable manner. As I mentioned earlier, the environment cannot be an afterthought to business. And this is not just because increasingly consumers demand to know that what they are consuming is ethically sound or because they are a powerful aviation watchdogs and industry bodies mandated to ensure the industry falls into line. That makes commercial sense for all of us to stay ahead of the curve and to embed sustainability criteria into every stage of the decision-making process. At Etihad, we have ramped up our business quickly, as Dave mentioned in his introduction. Last year, we carried over 7 million passengers. Our network extends to 72 cities of the world. We operate a fleet of 61 aircraft. We have 100 aircraft on older, and it took us just seven years to get to that point. During that rapid growth, we have focused on sustainability in two key areas. Of course, the first one is financial sustainability. Our target is to break even this year and to deliver sustainable long-term profitability thereafter. And we're certainly confident of doing that. The second is environmental sustainability. The advantage we have over legacy airlines is that thanks to an average aircraft age of less than four years, we can already claim industry-leading environmental performance. But with more aircraft will come more emissions. That is a challenge that we face. We constantly look for ways to improve efficiencies. In this respect, I think we already have a track record of success. Since 2006, for example, we have reduced CO2 emissions per passenger kilometre by 19%. We have implemented improved flight management systems that are saving us some 18,000 tonnes of fuel annually, which equates to a reduction of 56,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide. We use the very latest and most technologically advanced coating on our planes. Not only does this coating reduce drag and fuel consumption, it also reduces our cleaning requirements. Less cleaning means less water. 10 million litres a year less, which is quite an achievement. So seriously do we take our commitment to water conversation, we recently fitted 14,000 taps within our commercial and key residential facilities with devices to cut the amount we use by up to 70%. I guess you may take from this, it should be clear that we embrace technology and continue our investment in it to be successful. From the Wright brothers to the A380, Nothing underpins aviation like a willingness to seek better ways of doing what we do. Investing in technologies that improve environmental performance today is a huge business. Not because we're all environmentalists, but because what is better for the environment is generally more efficient and reduces cost. Airlines and their engines are today many times cleaner and quieter than they were 10, 20, 30 years ago. And as we expand, we continue to invest in how we continue to modernise and build a strong replacement program. Aircraft and engine technology will continue to lead improvements with each new aircraft delivering tangible per passenger efficiencies. I'm also excited about the opportunities that breakthroughs in composites will also afford the industry. Abu Dhabi is very active in this space with its composite manufacturing plant in our lane. As I said, no one, no one saves the world on their own. 
we must collaborate. Partnership across industries and geographies are vital to raising the bar on what is achievable in terms of environmentally sustainable flying. Sharing data, experiences, and even comparing frustrations are invaluable steps on the way to improve efficiencies. For example, only this summer, Etihad worked with Emirates, Virgin Australia, and numerous air traffic control jurisdictions on a revolutionary initiative to allow aircraft to fly to their full capability. The experiment enabling computerized flight management systems to calculate the route rather than relying on ground-based systems. Carried out under the auspices of the Indian Ocean Strategic Partnership to reduce emissions or inspire the flights which were operated between the Gulf and Australia provide a glimpse of what can be done. A 15 tonne saving in carbon emissions was made on just one flight between Abu Dhabi and Sydney, showing what can be achieved through cooperation and progressive thinking. It is important 